Well, good evening, good evening, good evening. Thank you to Sister Katie French. We certainly need the Lord to show us the way. Wow, so much is going on in our world today. Uh, I've been just captivated by the impeachment trial most of the day, as I'm sure some of you have also. Uh, we're just praying that uh, justice and truth will prevail and that people will do the right thing instead of doing what is politically expedient. But we thank God for another day's journey. Uh, it is Wednesday, uh, February the 10th, the year of our Lord, 2021. Welcome to another uh, virtual Bible study presented by the New Hope Baptist Church in Covington, Georgia. Uh, tonight, as we uh, start in, uh, with this lesson, we are remembering, as we always do, those who stand in the need of prayer. So much has been happening this week. Um, Brother Tavius Brown was funeralized, I believe that was Monday. So we're sending prayers out to his family. Uh, there are many others who have, uh, since then, who have died and succumbed uh, to the virus and others have died by various other means. I was disturbed to hear, I believe it was Monday, that there was an automobile accident on uh, 285. And I believe four or five people were, were killed as a result. And so uh, we prayed for their, for their family. And I believe that was another separate incident the same morning where another gentleman was killed on 285. And I heard today that that was a shooting on I-85 where someone was killed today. Just so much going on. And uh, certainly there ever was a time when the people of God need to be praying and sincerely praying that time is right now. We are remembering our brother Melvin Clark. Uh, we're praying, we're lifting him up in prayer. We are remembering, again, our friends from the New Beginning uh, Full Gospel uh, Baptist uh, Ministry 
in uh, Oxford, Georgia, Pastor Willie Tigner Jr. and his lovely wife, Dolly Tigner. We were lifting him up in our prayers as they are recovering from uh, the coronavirus. We're lifting up uh, all of our healthcare workers. We're lifting up the Petaway family. Um, just last Saturday, uh, the grandmother of Sister Ruthie, our own Sister Ruthie Petaway, her grandmother was buried. I believe that was down in Florida. Bless her heart, she was 101 years old. And we just thank God uh, for her long longevity, long, long life and longevity. Understand she was a victim of the COVID-19 virus. And I, you know, I was just thinking about that. Had it not been for COVID-19, she was already 101 years old. Uh, she may have lived uh, several more years. And so we just thank God uh, that he's still blessing with long life. And you know, the Bible promises that if we would just be uh, diligent to hearken to his command, uh, that he would give us a long life. So God bless your heart. Want to remind you now that on tomorrow, that's tomorrow, Thursday, as always, we will be sharing with our uh, New Hope prayer line. The New Hope prayer line. There's a call in prayer line. And that's every Thursday. That's from 7 p.m. until 7 30 p.m. And that is Eastern Standard Time. That is Eastern Standard Time. And I always emphasize that because I'm finding out that we're having viewers from all over the country and we're living in different time zones. And so we want to make sure we, we, we note the fact that the prayer line comes on and it's for 30 minutes from 7 p.m. until 7.30 p.m. That's Eastern Standard Time. That's every Thursday. And you can call in at 774-220-4020. That's 774-220-4020. And once you call in the access code, uh, to get into the room is 372-1137, followed by the pound sign. We certainly encourage you uh, to call in. The Lord has been doing some great things. I've certainly been encouraged uh, as we've been doing this now for several months. And uh, I'm really excited about what the Lord has done and what the Lord is doing through this prayer ministry. I think so often we minimize prayer. I hear people saying things like, well, you know, all we can do is just pray. But you know what? Prayer should never be a last resort. Prayer should be our first response. The greatest thing you can do is to pray because prayer will give you direction. Prayer will give you influence. Prayer will give you insight. And so if we pray first and act later, it will, it will amplify and uh, magnify our action. And so often we forget the real purpose of prayer. There's an old saying, and we, we use it quite often, that says prayer changes things. But you know, I've been studying prayer and looked in the, in the biblical text and prayer was not really designed and is not designed to change things. Prayer is designed to change us. And we, in turn, after we've been changed, will change things. So I want you to keep that in mind as you pray. And listen, don't just pray uh, on Thursday night. Don't just pray. Uh, when it's time for church, but you need to have a constant and vibrant prayer life because see, prayer is a conversation or having a conversation with God. Now, I want to remind you also that any real conversation is not just one-sided. So it's not just a matter of you telling God what you want, or telling God what you need during your prayer time. You also need to be still. You need to read the word 
You need to be still and you need to listen because oftentimes you're doing that time of prayer that God also wants to talk to you. And so again, we're lifting up all these various prayer concerns, all the COVID-19 patients who are suffering all over the world, all of the families who have lost a loved one as a result of the virus and other acts of death. And we're praying uh, for our essential workers. We're praying for uh, our doctors. We're praying for the nurses and all of the healthcare workers, even the custodians in the hospitals. We're praying for our funeral directors and funeral home personnel. Pray for all of those who help us uh, in our lives. And so we want to lift them up in prayer as well. But God bless you. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, and then we will be uh, starting our lesson for tonight. And by the way, the lesson tonight, uh, our main text will come from Revelation, book of Revelation, chapter 21, and verse uh, 8. We need to look at verses 7 and 8. We're going to talk about the faith of the fearful, faithless, and false. The faith of the fearful, faithless, and false, uh, some surprising inhabitants of the lake of fire. But for right now, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, in the name of Jesus, God, we thank you for just being who you are, and what you are in our lives. Lord, we thank you uh, that you enable us to go out uh, and go about our daily occupation. You kept us, God, from all hurt, harm, and danger. But we don't know how close we were to death. But you made the death angel behave. And you allowed our golden moments, as the old people used to say, to roll on a little while longer. And Father, we don't take that lightly. We thank you for it because we realize, God, that there were some who went to bed last night, did not get up this morning. And even some who got up this morning and did not make it to this time of the day. And so, God, we're here, and we understand it's not because of our goodness, but it's because of your grace and because of your providence that we're here, and we thank you for it, and because the fact that we're here tells us that you're giving us another chance to get it right. And, Lord, help us to take advantage of our time that we may redeem the time for the days are evil, and knowing, oh, God, that uh, we have a certain amount of time to do your will. And so, God, we pray now that you would apply our hearts to, that we will apply our hearts to wisdom and that we might be certified as the psalmist says how long we have to live father we thank you for what you're doing in all of our lives we thank you that you still hearing and answering prayer father we lift up that mother that father who's struggling to make ends meet in the midst of a pandemic we lift up the families of those who have died as a result of the virus, God comfort them as only you can, even those who are suffering right now, those in the hospital right now, God, who are struggling for their next breath. God, we just pray now that you would just be a merciful God to them. God, we thank you for what you're doing uh, with the doctors and the scientists as far as the vaccines are concerned. And we just pray, God, that uh, uh, soon and very soon, uh, things will get back to some sense of normalcy where we'll be able to fellowship one way or another again. But Father, in the meantime, we, we're still faithful and we're still uh, careful to give you all the praise, the glory, and the honor for you are an awesome God. And now, God, we ask that you would just open our ears and open our eyes and open our minds as we seek to study your word tonight. Now, give us a word, a rhema word, a revelation. Uh, that will help us uh, to be better sons and daughters, that we might be images of you, that when people look on us, they won't see us, but they'll see you in us and give you all the glory. This we pray now in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, and amen. Well, God bless you. God bless you. As we said now tonight, we're going to be uh, looking at uh, Revelation chapter 21 and verse uh, 8. 
We're going to be talking about the fate of the fearful, the faithless, and the false. So let's look and see what the word is for tonight. The fate of the fearful, faithless, and false. And we're looking at some, su some surprising inhabitants of the lake of fire. When, uh, when this lesson uh, first came to me, I was debating this week as to whether this would be uh, the teaching for tonight or the sermon for Sunday, uh, because there's so much in here that I think uh, we need to, to know. And uh, I think the Lord has a word uh, for us in this uh, text. So let's look at the fate of the fearful faithless and false, some surprising inhabitants of the lake of fire. And as I said, the text primarily is Revelation chapter 21, verse eight. And that's Revelation, that's not Revelations, no plural, it's a singular. We're talking about the Revelation. So it's Revelation chapter 21, verse eight. And I know a lot of times people don't like to go to Revelation because they're scared of it. A lot, of, a lot of weird stuff over there, but it's stuff that's edification for our souls. Let's look at verse 8 of chapter 21. He says, but the fearful the un and unbelieving and the abominable the mur and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. But the fearful and unbelieving and abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. That's Revelation chapter 21, verse 8, as it is uh, given to us in the King James Version. Version. Now, first of all, I want you to notice this is a list. There's a list. And lists are, are significant in the Bible. See, when the when the biblical authors, and there was a method to that madness, they, did, they didn't just put stuff down. Uh, the biblical authors didn't just list items or people as they came to mind, but they were attempting to make a theological statement with the order of the items on the list. For instance, if you were to do a research and find all of the biblical listings or everywhere where the, the apostles or the disciples are listed in the gospel account, you might note that Simon Peter is always listed first and Judas Iscariot, the betrayer, is always listed last. That's in every list. In each of the gospel writers, wherever you find the list of the apostles, Simon Peter, his name will always appear first on the list. And Judas Iscariot, who betrayed Jesus, will always be last. Now that, that's, that's not by accident. There's a theological purpose in putting Simon first and Judas last. And that's not to say that the other items or the other people on the list are not important. 
but rather this is done, the biblical authors did this in order to highlight the first and the last items on the list for a theological reason. Now, when I looked at this list, Revelation chapter 21, verse 8, I looked at the list, and uh, I was surprised at a couple of the items or the groups of people on the list. Now, I, I, the thing that the one that particularly surprised me was the fearful. I, 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 I you, you wouldn't expect. I mean, these these are the people who are going to be cast into the lake of fire, who are going to suffer eternal damnation. And the fearful is included in that listing of people. And listen, not only is the fearful on the list, but the fearful are first on the list. Now, I just told you now that when you have lists in the Bible, all items are important, but the first item and the last item are particularly important for theological reasons. And, and so not only are the fearful on the list, but the fearful are first. And then you have the unbelieving. Wow. Second on the list. Now, when you look at that list, I, you know, I, I have no issue with the abominable going to hell, murderers, sorcerers, idolaters, and liars. I, I can see them in the lake of fire. But it seems like the fearful and the faithless seem to be on, you know, on the surface seem to be less deserving of the lake of fire than the rest. Like I said, one would expect the abominable, the murderers, the whoremongers, the sorcerers, the idolaters, and, and, and all liars. Oh, well, yes. We would expect them to have their part. But the fearful and the faithless? Wow. That's, that's a head scratch. That's a head scratch. And so let's, let's take a closer look and, and see if we can ascertain why these or this, these, these groups might be listed in this list. So perhaps a brief word study uh, would help us to understand the gravity of being fearful and faithless. Now, the word for fearful in the Greek text, and when we're dealing with the New Testament, uh, we need to be mindful that the New Testament, as we have it, given to us, the original autographs, what John and James and all of them wrote down, were, they were written in Greek. Okay, what you, the Bible you hold in your hand is a version of a translation that was derived from numerous manuscripts that were copied from the original autographs. The originals, what the biblical writers actually wrote, they're called autographs. The copies of them are called manuscript. And then of course, they're in Greek. And so to get to us, there has to be some translation involved to another language. And so you have translation, and then you have several versions of that translation. So 
the Bible you hold in your hand, that's what that is. That's a version, uh, one version of a translation that was derived from several manuscripts. Now, from what we understand, uh, all of the original autographs have been lost. But we have several manuscripts, thousands of manuscripts. And the amazing thing about it is that of all of those thousands of manuscripts, there are small, minute differences. But those differences are so small, they don't, as my mama used to say, they don't mount to a heel of a beam. And that's the miracle of the biblical text, that of all this time, all those thousands of manuscripts, they overall generally agree. But now, I digress. The Greek word in this text for fearful is a word called delos, delos. It is not the commonly used Greek word for fear. The most common Greek word for fear used in the New Testament is a word called phobio. And phobio means to put to flight by terrifying, to scare away, uh, to flee, to fear, to be afraid, to be struck with fear, to be seized with alarm of those, it, it speaks of those startled by strange sights or occurrences or those struck with amazement. You know, when, when the people saw the angels in their glory, they were struck with fear. That was phobia. And it's from this Greek word phobia uh, that we get our English word phobia, you know, claustrophobia and aerophobia and all these different phobias comes from this Greek word uh, phobia. And this is the most common term for fear in the Greek New Testament. But however now, this fear in this text in Revelation 21 and eight, when we talk about the fearful, the Greek word is not phobio or phobos, the Greek word is delos. And this is a different kind of fear. This is a different, this is a, this is a different kind of fear. This is not the common uh, fear that you find throughout the Bible. This is a different kind of fear. So, Delios is described as timid, fearful, cowardly. When Jesus rebuked the disciples, um, as they were in the ship. You remember, they were about to cross over and a storm came up. And they got so disturbed and the Bible says Jesus was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow. And they ran down and they woke him up and it says, Master, carest thou not that we perish? And as you read that story in all of the gospel accounts, uh, Jesus gets up and he says to them, why are you so fearful? And this delios, this delos is the root Greek word he used. In other words, he's saying, why are you acting like cowards? <laughs> you know, this, this, they were not just terrified. He says, well, you know, they were terrified, but he, he, he uses the word delos. And it seems to me to imply, and, I, and you know, I don't, I don't, I don't hear much preaching on this angle from this angle. But it seems to me imply to imply that Jesus was saying to him, you know, you could have handled this without me. I mean, you know, have confidence, have faith in God. Why are you so fearful? Why are you so cowardly? He's rebuking them. So this, 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 this delos uh, talks about is referring to persons showing fear in a shameful way, coward. Now, this adjective delos is found only three times, only three times in the entire Greek New Testament. Here in our text, Revelation 21 and 8, is found in Mark 4 and 40, 
And I just told you about Matthew 8 and 26. And by the way, that Mark 4 and 40 is the parallel text. That's Mark's version of what happened as they're out there on the street. So it's only found uh, three times in those gospel accounts and here in Revelation chapter 21, verse 8. Now, however, there are some other noun forms, because uh, this delos is an adjective. This is a descriptive word. It's an adjective. But there are other noun forms that have the root. And that's found in John uh, 14 and 27. John 14 and 27. And also in 2 Peter chapter uh, 1, verse 7, because we're all familiar with that passage in uh, 2 Timothy 1 and 7, God has not given us the spirit of fear. God has not given us a cowardly spirit. That's what he's saying. That's the, talk, that's the kind of fear he's talking about. God has not given us the spirit of cowardice, but of love, power, and a sound mind. Let's, let's see what it says. In uh, uh, John 14 and 27, he says, yeah, yeah. He says, peace I leave with you. This is Jesus talking to the disciples. He says, peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. Not as the world giveth, give I you. Let not your heart be troubled. That means agitated, disturbed. Neither let it be afraid and that word afraid the, the greek word behind it is it don't 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 let your heart be cowardly that's what he's talking about this is this is a negative word this is a fear you, you don't want now there's another there's another word for fear that that that's that's talking about reverence and, and, and reverential fear of god that's that's used a couple of times in, in, in the Greek New Testament. The fear of God, that's, that's a good fear. The Bible says in Proverbs, the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. So that's a good fear. And then, of course, that's phobios. That's the fear everybody has been terrified. But this delos is, is, is a bad fear. So in all forms, you got the three adjective forms uh, found in Matthew 20, 8, 26, Mark 4, 40, and Revelation, our text, 21 and 8. And you got the two noun forms found in Matt and John 14 and 27, and in 2 Timothy 1 and 7. We're only found five times primarily. Five times. And it refers to cowardly fear, lack of courage. This is shameful fear. Okay. Now. My mama used to always say, God can't use no coward soldiers. And this concept is also found in the Old Testament. And I'm just going to read that to you in three different versions. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 20, verse 8. And, and this is Moses giving the commandments as to how the people should act when they go to war. And he says, the officers shall speak further to the people, and they shall say, what man is there? Now, now, a couple of verses before that and after, they talked about if a man has a wife, just married, let him go home. Let him enjoy his wife. He don't want to get killed in battle before he have time to enjoy his wife. So he, he, he's given a stipulation of war. How they should conduct themselves as they prepare for war. He says, and what man is there that is fearful and faint-hearted? Let him go and return unto his house, lest his brethren's heart faint as well as his heart. In the complete Jewish Bible, it says the official will then add to what they said to the soldiers, is there, is there a man here who is afraid and faint-hearted, scared of cat? He should go back home. Otherwise, his fear may demoralize his comrades as well. He's saying now that this kind of fear is contagious. It's contagious, like a common cold. You know, if you're scared, you need to go home because you're gonna, you're gonna, you're gonna demoralize and make the people around you 
afraid. And of course, in the Amplified Bible, it says, and also shall speak further to the people and say, what man is fearful and faint-hearted, let him return to his house, lest because of him, his brethren's mind and heart faint as does his own. And so what he's simply saying here, and this is the same type of fear, uh, what we just talked about, dealing with, it, this is cowardly fear. God can't use you no know, coward soldier. This is the kind of fear that makes you be quiet when you should be speaking. This is the kind of fear that makes you afraid uh, and you sit down when you should be standing up. This is the kind of fear that many people in Congress are experiencing right now. Because instead of acting with courage, they're acting as cowards. And they're doing things that's more politically expedient than what is morally right and good for the nation. They are suffering from Delos fear, fear of this text. God can't use you no know, coward. So, so the fearful and late, that, that would be those, they, these would be those who lack the courage to stand on the conviction of their faith and testimony against the forces of evil, spiritual and material forces that are opposed to the kingdom of God. These are those silenced by fear and the intimidation of the world. Those who do not confess Christ because they fear what others might say. Those who are afraid to give up the world and to deny self. Those who fear taking a stand for Christ. Those who fear to fellowship or to become identified with Christian people. See, the Bible says in Proverbs chapter 29, verse 20, uh, 25, the fear of man bringeth a snare. But whosoever put his trust in the Lord shall be saved. And Jesus said, but whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father, which is in heaven. So this is talking about this cowardly fear. And listen, people, we have to pray for courage. We have to pray for strength. Because if you don't watch it, this fear will captivate you and control your life. But as Paul said to his young protege, Timothy, God has not given us the spirit of cowardice. God has not given us this cowardly fear of love. We have a spirit of love, power, and a sound mind. But the fearful, John said, be cast into the lake of fire. This, this fear, this type of fear leads to eternal death. All right, so let's look now at the faithless. The faithless. The King James uses the term unbelieving. But the Greek term encompasses more than just the idea of not believing. The Greek term is a word called apistos. Apistos. And the primary meaning is unfaithful, faithless, that is not to be trusted, incredible of things, unbelieving, incredulous, without trust in God. Now remember, when we talked about List, notice this first meaning or the primary meaning of, uh, of uh, unbelieving or apistos is unfaithful. Now, when we talk about faith, 
in our modern terms, we, we usually we're usually thinking about our, our believing something. But in the Bible, the primary meaning of faith is not always about what you believe. It's about being faithful. Not about necessarily uh, about believing something to be true, but it's rather is about that of not being faithful in the sense of a man not being faithful, that is in forsaking all others to his wife. You know, if you're unfaithful to your spouse, then you're, you know, you're messing around with other people that you're not married to. You know, you're, you're, not, you're not being faithful. And this is, this is, the, this is the primary sense uh, of, 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 of faith in this context. So the primary idea when he talks about faithless in this verse is not talking about primary about what you believe, but he's talking about the idea of not being reliable, not being true, not being steadfast. Hmm? Wow. See, biblical faithfulness is more, much more than just mental assent or mental belief. See, we, we cheapen the idea in our, with our modern usage because when we talk about faith, we're primarily talking about what you believe, your creeds, your doctrine, what you believe about Jesus, what you believe. But in the Bible, faith and belief was much more than that. It included dedication, reliance, and dependency. Can God depend on you? How dependable are you? Are you true to your word? Are you reliable? That, that's, that's, that's faithfulness in the Bible. See? So to believe in Jesus, was more than just say, oh, I, you know, I, I believe in my heart. And, you know, uh, and, and we made that primary. You got to believe in your heart. Well, it's more than just believing in your heart. Yes, it's more. Because you got to believe in your heart, your hand, and your feet too. See, to believe in Jesus in the Bible is illustrated when the disciples left their nets. They trusted and relied on Jesus. They left in there. They left their life with him. Why? Because he called them. James and John left the boat and followed Jesus. Matthew left the tax collector's table and followed Jesus. It involved a man leaving home and letting the dead bury the dead, forsaking what he thought was his Jewish obligation as a good son to hang around and make sure daddy was taken care of until he died. And see, that's what he was telling Jesus. The man, the man, the man's father was not dead when Jesus called him. He was very much alive. But, but what the man was trying to tell Jesus, he said, he was saying to Jesus, let me fulfill my obligation as a good Jewish son to take care of my father in his old age until he dies, and then I'll come follow you. But Jesus says, the gospel of the kingdom has priority. He says, let the dead bear the dead. Let those who do not have this calling upon their life, let them do that. But you go preach the kingdom of God. Biblical faithfulness uh, involved incurring the wrath of Caesar and Rome by confessing Jesus is Lord. You know, we 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 toss that around as this if as if it's a cliche, but to say Jesus is Lord in first century Palestine could very well cost you your life because the Pledge of Allegiance at that time was the common declaration 
of allegiance to the country or allegiance to Rome that says Caesar is Lord. So you see, to say Jesus is Lord was not just a declaration of faith in a sense of mental assent, but it was a declaration of faith that it could cost them their very lives. So biblical belief and biblical faith was not cheap. It was costly. And I want to suggest to you that the faith God requires of us is the same faith he required of them. Is not cheap, it's cost. And we cheapen the idea of faith when we just narrow it down to just mental assent, much more than that. So when he talks about the faithless, he's not, he's not talking about those who just don't believe in their hearts. He's talking about those who are unreliable, those who, who cannot be dependent upon. Now, Jesus talked about faith in the Bible. He talked about three kinds of faith. He talked about great faith, talked about little faith, talked about no faith. Now, the irony of that, if you study that, you will discover that every time Jesus used the term great faith, he was talking to a Gentile outside of the household of Israel. Great faith. People who should have had faith didn't have great faith. They, they had little faith, and many of them had no faith. Now, this word, apistus, that, that A in front of it, translated A, is, 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 the Greek, is the Greek letter alpha. And anytime you have an alpha in front of a, a, a word, it's called the alpha privative. And what that does, that negates the word. So a, a pistis literally means no faith. You know, so, you, you know, amoral, no moral. So those who have no faith, those who are unreliable, those who are not dependable, and those who do not believe will have their place in the lake of fire. Now, you know, now, so why is this a lake, a fire lake offense? Why? It is because faith is essential to salvation. One cannot be saved without faith in, that is trusting in and relying upon the finished work of Christ. Jesus says in John, 14 and 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father except by me. Now, we are saying, a lot of us are saying to make that declaration today, but listen, Jesus puts us in a pickle because he's saying, because we, we're living in a time now where people are suggesting there's more than one way to get to God. That there are several ways, all these are good ways, and they all end up going to God. But that's not what Jesus said. Jesus, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except, he says, by me. Let's look at the, pre the preaching of the apostles in Acts chapter 4, verse 12. This is the preaching of the apostles. I believe this is probably... Probably uh, Peter, yeah, Peter and James, at the time, and Peter and John, rather, at the time when they healed the, the man at the temple and they were being um, integrated by the council. And let's pick up at uh, verse 10, uh, what Peter says. Well, let's go back to verse 8. Go to verse 8. It says, Then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said to them, Ye rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day be examined of the good deed done to the impotent man, by what means he is made whole, be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, 
whom God raised from the dead, even by him does this man stand here before you whole. By the way, the word whole is the word saved. <laughs> okay? Uh, salvation in the biblical sense was more than just spiritual. But that's another lesson for another day. He says, this is a stone which was set at naught of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. Here's our verse. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. No other name but the name of Jesus. So yeah, belief in Jesus. Then this faithfulness as far as unique dedication. Jesus says to, to, uh, to Satan as he was being tempted in the wilderness. And let's look at that, Matthew 4 and 10. He says, uh, thou shalt uh, worship the Lord thy God, and him only shall thy serve. Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shall thy serve. That's what Jesus said to, to the tempter, to Satan. So faithfulness involves unique dedication. Jesus is the only one. God is the only one. You can't serve God and money. You can't serve God in popularity. You can't serve God in the world. You must be faithful to him. And then steadfastness, the idea of steadfastness, uh, where it says, uh, uh, he that endureth to the end, Matthew 24 and 13, he that endureth, to the end shall be saved. And let me say a word about uh, Revelation 2, 2.10, because I hear this often at funeral. And I think we that's one of the one of the passages that we have we've misused and abused. But but he's talking now in the context of the church at Smyrna. Uh, and he's talking about uh he says, start at verse 10, he says, fear not of those things which thou shalt, and, uh, shalt suffer. This is the angel giving the word, you know, to the church of Smyrna. He says, behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, and ye may be tried, and ye shall have tribulation 10 days. This is the context which he said now. He says, and uh, uh, yeah. 10 days, be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. And in the context of that passage, he's not talking about, you know, we, we say unto, but we mean until. He's not talking about be faithful until you grow old and die. He's saying be faithful even if it costs you your life. That's what he's talking about. That's the context of that passage. That's what unto death means. Be faithful. Even if it costs you your life. Now, he wasn't talking about somebody 90 years old and dying of old age. Oh, he was faithful unto death. No, he was faithful until he died. If he was faithful. That's faithful until. That's not faithful unto. Because faithful unto means being faithful even if it costs you your life. So, well, we skip uh, the rest of those on the list uh, because I wanted to talk a little bit about the false, you know. Uh, we skip the abominable, the whoremongers. Those are obvious. We know they, they should be in the lake of fire. And even the false we know, but I wanted to I wanted to, I wanted to mention a word about the false because you know we're living in a time now where people lie and don't think nothing of it. 
I mean, in the world, you know, we see it in our, in our political world right now. Uh, people lie as a matter of political convenience. And what's so crazy about it, they're lying and they know they're lying and they know that you know they're lying, but yet they persist in lying as if they tell a lie long enough, it'll become true. Such a delusion. But he said, those people have a place in the lake of fire. So the false will be outdoors and out of sight. Uh, Psalms 101 and seven says, he that worketh deceit shall not dwell within my house, is the Lord talk. He that telleth lies shall not tarry in my sight. My mama used to say all the time, you know, the Bible says, a liar won't tarry in his sight. That's what, this is what she got that from. This verse, Psalms 101 and seven. He that worketh deceit shall not dwell within my house, he that telleth lies shall not tarry in my sight. Now, I got another list here. This is found, this list is found in Proverbs chapter six, verses 16 through 19. And I brought this up because lying and falsehood is on this list twice. So it's true what the Bible says, God, God, you know, God hates a lie for more reasons than one. It says right here, six things, Proverbs says, six things doth the Lord hate. Yea, seven are an abomination unto him. Look at them. Look at them. A proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that divides wicked imaginations. In other words, a heart's always, a person who's always thinking of evil stuff. Feet that are swift in running to mischief. mischief. Here it is again, a second time. A false witness. This is in the area of testimony, lying on the oath. A false witness, a false witness that speaketh lies. And there it is. He that soweth discord among brothers. The Bible says these seven things. God or the Lord hates. And that hates a strong word. My friend, make sure you're not on this list. Proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked imaginations, feet that are swift and run into mischief, a false witness, a giving false testimony under oath, false witness who speaks lies, and he that soweth discord among brothers. I got a feeling a lot of us got to work on that last one on the list. Get off. But we need to work to get off this list because these are seven things the Lord hates. Now, lying is so bad, the falsehood is so bad, and the false is so bad because it is indicative of the character of Satan, the devil. Jesus said to this the scribes and Pharisees of his day, he says, ye are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. The complete Jewish Bible says, you belong to your father, Satan. And you will carry out your father's desire for from the start he was a murderer and he has never stood by the truth because there is no truth in him. When he tells a lie, he's speaking in character. He's only doing what's natural because he's a liar, indeed, the inventor of the lie. Amplified Bible puts it this way. You are of your father the devil 
And it is your will to practice the lust and gratify the desires which are characteristics of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks of falsehood, he speaks what is natural to him, for he is a liar himself and the father of lies and all that are false. This word for liar in this text is a word called, in the Greek called sudes, 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 sudes. That's P-S, P is silent, sudes, sudes. This is lying, false, deceitful. It is the opposite of alithes, which is truthful. It's substantial as one who tells lies, a liar. And I have here, I couldn't help it. Liar, liar, pants on fire. Because if you persist in that type of behavior, you will end up literally in the lake of fire. And all those who lie, their plates will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur. The New English translation says, that is the second death. You see, all liars will have their a place in the lake of fire because they are the exact opposite of the God of truth. God is the God of truth. Deuteronomy. Uh, well, let's look at let's look at uh, Numbers 23 and 19. Numbers 23 and 19. Let's see what uh, let's see what that says about the God of truth. Numbers 23 and 19. Let's see, let's see, let's see. Yeah, that's the one we are we, we're familiar with that. God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. Have he said, and shall he not do it? And have he spoken? And shall he not make it good? See, the liar, listen, the liar is the one who says stuff and is not reliable. And here's, a, here's a little thing we got we got to quit doing. We we got to, and, and please don't just tell folk stuff you think they want uh, they want to hear. You know, have you known of somebody? who you ask them for something and they tell you they can do it. And later on, a couple days later, they call you and say, well, hey, I can't, you know why, you know why I tell you I can do it? I can't do it. Now, sometimes, they, sometimes it's legit. But often, they knew they couldn't do it in the first place. But they told you what they thought you wanted to hear. Can I tell you something? Sometimes the truth is hurt. The truth hurts. It's disappointing. But it's better to be truthfully disappointed than to be deceitfully and falsely made confident. You see, because if I if I ask you for five dollars. And uh, you said, well, yeah, I'll give it to you tomorrow. And tomorrow come, and you don't have the $5. You talk to me, well, you know, I know I promised I'd give you $5, but I don't have it. Well, I mean, you, you, not only have you messed me up because, because I, I can't get the $5 from you that you knew you didn't have in the first place, but I could have asked somebody else for the $5, but I was depending on you to give me the $5. So therefore, I didn't ask the other person. I could have asked somebody else who would have given me the money. See what I'm saying? But because you gave me your word that was false in the first place and you knew it, I suffered. And so that, that, that's the kind of thing we quite often we do that. And we need to stop. Be truthful, be honest. All liars have that place in the lake of fire, he said. 
liars will be excluded from the city. We're talking about the heavenly city, city, Jerusalem, the eternal city. He described the city in Revelation 21, 23 through 27. He says, and the city has no need of the sun or of the moon to shine it, for the glory of the Lord has illuminated it. And his lamp is the lamb. The nations will walk by his light and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. And in the daytime, for there will be no night there. His gates will never be closed. And they will bring the glory and honor of the nations into it and nothing unclean. And no one who practice abomination and lying shall enter or ever come into it, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb Books of Life, in the Lamb Book of Life. Another thing about that city, not is in a couple of verses above that, it says there's no temple in the city. <laughs> Won't be no, no church houses in New Jerusalem. Because the lamb will be the temple of the city. Revelation 22, 14, 15 says, Blessed are those who wash their robes so that they may have a right to the tree of life and may enter by the gates into the city. Outside are the dogs and the sorcerers and the immoral persons and the murderers and the idolaters, all bad folk. But guess what? Also outside is everyone who loves and practices lying. Mm. The lake. The lake. You know, many modern believers are repulsed by the idea so much so that some even reject the idea of eternal punishment. For they reason that God is a God of love and a God of love would never allow people to suffer eternally. But it is precisely because God is a God of love that Jesus was sent into the world. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, his only unique son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish and have eternal life. And we need to tack on, whenever we quote that, that's John 3, 16. But I want to suggest that, that you don't quote that unless you quote John 3, 17 with it. And John 3, 17 says, for God did not send the son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. John says later on in his letter, he says, but this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not grievous. Yes, God is a God of love, but he's a God of love and justice. Abraham says that it be far from thee to do after this manner, to slay the righteous with the wicked, and that the righteous should be as the wicked, that it be far from thee, shall not the judge of all the earth do right. This is when he was bargaining with God. You know, he went down from 50, you can just find 50, all the way down to 10. Think about it now, as evil and as wicked as Sodom and Gomorrah was. If they had only found 10 righteous people, Sodom and Gomorrah would have been spared. But they couldn't even find 10. Daniel says, many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. And I'm reading these passages because, you know, we can close our eyes and pretend it's not there, but there, there, there's substantial biblical evidence that supports the idea 
of eternal punishment and eternal damnation. Paul says in Romans, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ, our Lord. And here it is, Revelation, part of what we just read, part of our text, is adding on verse 7. He that overcometh, interesting thing, that word overcometh in, in the Greek is a word called uh, nikeo. From where we get the Nike tennis shoes, the conqueror. He that conquers, he that who, who overcomes, shall inherit all things. And I will be his God, and he will be my son. But this is the contrast. The contrast to one who overcomes is the one who's fearful, unbelieving, abominable, murderer, homemongers, sorcerers, and idolaters, and all liars, he says, shall have their part. And the lake which burned with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. And so, as we conclude tonight, we must be mindful that all of our decisions, actions, and even our beliefs have eternal consequences. And while Paul in Philippians 4 and 8 gives us a list of things we should think on. The Apostle John in Revelation 21 and 8 gives us a no-fly zone list. This is a listing of actions and behaviors we should seek to overcome and to avoid at all costs, lest we suffer an eternally grave consequence. And again, the word says, he that overcomes shall inherit all things. I will be his God, he shall be my son. But the fearful, that is the cowardly, the scared of cat, the unbelieving, those who are faithless, those who are unreliable, those who are untrustworthy, those who are not dependable, those who are not true, the abominable, and murderers, and whoremongers, and sorcerers, and idolaters, and all liars, those who propagate the lie, who practice and love lying for their own benefit and gain to deceive others. All of them, he says, shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which he says is the second death. Well, God bless you, my friend. I pray and hope this lesson has, has been of some spiritual value to you and that uh, you've been edified and blessed by it. Certainly it was for me as I was preparing and researching uh, to bring it to you. And listen, if it has been a blessing to you, it will be a blessing to someone else. So I encourage you to uh, share this on your page uh, with your family and all of your Facebook friends so that they too may be blessed by the word. You can find this lesson and the sermon from Sundays. You can find all of them in the video section of uh, the church Facebook page. There's a, could be a video section. You can find all of our videos that we've been doing. It's been almost a year now. Next month will be a year, matter of fact. Third, third week of next month will make a year. Uh, and then you can also find them on my personal YouTube page. And I want to encourage you to go there and become a subscriber. Well, listen, it's been a blessing and a bit of joy. And I pray and hope that uh, the rest of your week will be great. Uh, be careful. Continue to practice social distancing. Wear masks. And then now they even with all these variants coming out, they're recommending that you double masks. And so we want to do our part to make sure we stop the spread. Because listen, listen. I know we're meeting virtually now, but I pray for the day. And I want you to be around, and I hope to be around when we can meet in person and fellowship together. So God bless you. Hope to hear from you tomorrow night during our prayer line. But in the meantime, I pray that the Lord will bless you real good. Hope you have a good night and be blessed. And remember, share God's love with someone else because sometimes the only God they will see is the God
and have a good night.